All right, it's just about three minutes to the hour of a seven o'clock. Thank you all so much for stay with, staying with us here on the No Morning Show. And something that we thought we would share with you is to just have the police here with us on a Monday, every Monday morning, so that all of these issues can get ironed out, whatever thoughts you may have, whatever questions you may have. And so we're starting this Monday with Inspector Steve Mar McKenzie. McKenzie, sorry, with Inspector Steve McKenzie, just to talk about the enforcement of the public health regulations. So, of course, the Prime Minister announced to us on Saturday that, you know, we missed the opportunity of seeing him behind bars for drinking a beer in public. So let's just start there, Inspector. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Natalie, and good morning to your viewing and listening public. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to represent yeah. the interests of the organization. I am really, really grateful that, you know, the Acting Commissioner took up this role to, to have the police with us here, just so we can, you know, to me, perception can change if people have information and have sufficient information. Correct information. Yeah, and, and correct yes. information. So let's talk about what the Prime Minister shared with us on Saturday. Can the police now go and charge a Prime Minister for drinking a beer in public? Let me start by saying uh, whatever we do in a public space for the most part has to be consistent with any written law. In this ideal situation you're referring to, we have what we refer to as the public health regulations. And under the public health regulations, the, we speak about safe zones and the activities that can be conducted within those safe zones. For instance, consumption of alcohol, in-house dining, and, and other, other things. Those activities are generally conducted within the precincts of that safe zone. The same regulation also caters for the consumption or the reasonable consumption of food or drink. It does not go into specify whether the food or drink has to be alcohol or otherwise. But again, listen to the term, reasonable consumption. So the person who has to consider that reasonableness has to be able to justify to any sober thinking person that your action or your consumption of that food or drink was actually warranted and reasonable under the circumstances. So bearing that in mind, you can eat, you can drink in public. And uh, the issue of the consumption comes when you have to take off the face mask for the consumption, not necessarily the eating or drinking, because there's no offense to eat or drink. Yeah. The offense comes when you take off the mask to reasonable consume food or drink. Yeah, and, and I think that's important for people to understand this clarity because here we are, of course, the, the, the opposition is up in arms. The government, the, the, the police they should charge a prime minister now. But you mentioned a point that reasonableness, isn't it also up to the discretion of the police in a lot of these instances, not just with the consumption of alcohol, but just with the enforcement of the public health regulations to use its discretion to determine whether or not it wants to charge someone, someone yes. yes or no? Ultimately, the police officers are the arm of the law that you know we are here to enforce or ensure that all decisions all activities regarding the whole management of this COVID-19 pandemic within the Trinidad Tobago is actually complied with in accordance with the guidelines of the, the government as the case may be. What the government has done they've legislated our laws so what we do we enforce those laws and those laws has to be consistent with the agenda in terms of what needs to be accomplished in terms of managing this, this pandemic. So once we understand what is the intention, then as police officers, we use our discretion in terms of our hard approach, our soft approach. So we may appeal to someone or group of persons to not breach the law, because many a times persons are in breach of the law and for some reason, they believe that they're in the right. So as police officers, it's one of our duties to inform them of the offense that they would have been committed and then warn them to desist from committing yeah. any further breaches of that particular law. If they would continue to persist to, to breach the law, then it is within the police officer's right to cause that person to appear before a competent authority, a magistrate for instance, to answer a charge. Um, there may be instances where as police officers, we can arrest directly or immediately and as well they may not be opportunity where you can arrest. And many times we see 
police officers treat with situations and, and the police officers walk away. Not every time you see that, it means that it ends there because the police officer has also the opportunity to proceed by what we call summons. Yeah. So we can take some basic information and you still end up before a magistrate. So it's not always arresting someone directly or charging someone directly. All right, so let us talk about this idea of this whole uh, matter with Adrian Schoon. What made this particular situation so different that we didn't see an immediate charge you know, of the breaking of the public health regulations or we know the public health regulations. We know what safe zones are. What was so different about this? Why it was treated differently? So I would speak broadly rather yeah, than be specific definitely. to any situation. We take each situation on its own merit and we have investigators. There's a saying, he who alleges must prove. So we start with an allegation information comes to the, the police officer, the police has to conduct an investigation. Arising out of the findings of that investigation, decisions can be made as to how we choose to proceed, or we may get directive sometimes from the director of public prosecutions, who is a safeguard as well for the police officers so that it cannot be said that the police on their own act in any particular way that is um, not in the best interest of any one particular person or group of persons. So once we have sufficient evidence or we are clear in our mind that this is the direction that we should go or the approach that we should have, then as law enforcement officers, that approach would be uh, um, enforced. It doesn't mean that it's a blanket approach for every single situation, but again, you have to take into consideration a number of factors. Sometimes just because it's in the best, um, in the public's best interest, sorry, to act decisively, to act swiftly, you have a particular course of action, and then depending again on who and circumstances, you may very well have a softer approach for the same offense. So it all depends. Right. But what, what determines what kind of approach is taken? Circumstances. Circumstances. So, and I'll again, just use an example. So you have a crowd of, let's say, violent persons um, engaging police officers. You wouldn't stand and speak softly to that group of persons and, you know, saying kumbaya with them as an example. <laughs> Your action has to meet the aggression to treat with the situation. Mm -hmm. Because our responsibility as police officers is to ensure that every place in China Tobago is safe. The question is, how do we accomplish that? How do we really execute that? And if we were to be very confrontational with every single situation, every person that breaches law and order, we may have an act in China Tobago. So yeah. we have to measure what we do and how we do it. Um, a police officer always has to be tactful in terms of learning how to de-escalate a situation in comparison to making it worse. And that takes time, that takes a bit of tact and some experience in terms of how we do that. Um, All right, so, so then Inspector, let us look at two protests that we had recently or, or two, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a march, but people gathering to put a message out there against what's happened. We had one on the highway, Beetham Highway, uh, last week, and we had one yesterday in the Savannah, just at cursory glance. What made these two uh, things different? Because I don't know that the one on Beetham Highway was friendly and kumbaya either, but we saw tear gas in the Savannah yesterday as compared to Beetham. What makes those two situations different in terms of how the police responds? Quickly put, straightforward behavior. That's, that's, it comes down to behavior. So, as I said before, as law enforcement officers, our responsibility is to ensure that they maintains, or, or shall I say, law and order is maintained yeah. throughout the length and breadth of China and Tobago. And while we have a constitutional right to protest, our protest must not infringe any rights and freedoms of other persons. So, for, for example, the, the blockage of roads or even um, when you choose to, to have a march on the pavement and you obstruct persons from through movement on the pavement, that, that in itself would be a breach on someone else's rights and may very well be in breach of some other written law. In comparison to a peaceful, um, silent protest or something of the sort, now, when it comes to marches, we're speaking about something totally different because you're required to have permission from the Commissioner of Police 
Dr. March, and I'm speaking to you because I lost a bit of trend of thought in relation to the question that you asked me. No, I was asking the difference between the two, the approach by the police to the difference with the, the, the two, to me, protests. Because, right. mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that, I was saying that the one on Beetham wasn't a kumbaya moment either, but we didn't see the use of tear gas or that kind of thing. So what was different about the two situations which would warrant the police ad ad addressing them differently? So le let's look at the one in Bitam first. So in, in the Bitam situation, we had a police being division for the most part, um, and other police officers would be generally treated with the issue of the, the, the demonstration there was not a need to call in what we consider to be a public order team. And that public order team is that team of officers with the responsibility of crowd control, crowd management, dispersing of the crowd, or any unruly activity or riotous activity that residents or, or a group of persons, 12 or more, may choose to engage in. Um, in sharp contrast, the activity in the Queen's Park Savannah from the persons who were on the ground, they were of the opinion that there was need for that public order team to be dispatched to the area. And of course, when the public order team comes to the area, it means that, yeah, this is serious enough for them to be here. And them being there by itself is what we consider a management in terms of our use of force, because presence of police officers' presence is part of our use of force policy. Then our verbal commands to the crowd. In both instances, in terms of um, you need to stop, you need to remove, you need to disperse, you need to go home, and you would generally speak to lead, the leaders to cause those persons who may um, be followers to disperse, to discontinue their activities. And uh, in the case of the Beatum, there was that cooperation, and as you saw the, the, the protests, it, um, it, it quickly was quelled. In comparison to the the Queen's Park Savannah, and it went on and on for, for quite some time, as I said, till the public order team were called in, and uh, to the point where they had to deploy some irritant gas. And uh, those circumstances under which, under which, sorry, those gases are normally used have to be extreme. It has to be to the point where it's warranted. It has to be the, to the point where you the, the crowd is becoming unruly or, or, or riotous or um, they may be throwing missiles, as was the case yesterday, as an example, and other activities that would cause the police now to engage in a different form of yeah. activity to control the crowd before it gets worse. Because I'll tell you, if indeed circumstances are not controlled early, then you may move from 1,000 to 10,000 persons to treat with. Okay? So that's, that's the difference between the two. Well, I'm happy you explained because I have seen people talk about it on social media in terms of you know, how the police responds and if it's Beetham, they don't do this and it, the, the, how they have this approach in the Savannah. So I'm, I'm happy you explained, you know, how the police intervenes with these things and treats with these things and it's always based on how the crowd is yeah. responding. And I want you to remember that police officers come from society, yeah? So that the same grievance you would have, Natalie, I may have individually or personally, but it should not and cannot in any way cause me as a police officer to treat with situations differently. I should, I cannot be blinded by my personal opinion or perspective on a situation as a police officer. I may empathize with you, I may sympathize with you, but at the end of the day, I have a responsibility and a job yeah. to execute you know, my, my requirements. Uh, and, and finally, Inspector, does the public health regulations speak to the idea of fake vaccination cards? The public health regulation does not speak to the issue of fake fake vaccination cards, the Minister of Health, I remember him speaking to it. Um, we have what we call the 4G Act that covers the issue of fake vaccination cards and any activity by an individual to deceive or fraudulently, um, you know, to have that, that fraudulent document in his possession or intend to use the documentation, he can find himself in breach of the law and the, under the 4G Act you can be sentenced a term of about seven years. Um, it may also amount a case of larceny. The question is, how did you come in possession of this fraudulent cards? And we know sometime early this month, police officer charged a gentleman for possession of seven um, immunization cards. So we have reports of fraudulent um, immunization cards. And as police officers, we have been exercising our, our job in terms of yeah. how we, we, so, we so investigate. So that person who was charged, was it for 
fraudulent cards or larceny? Larceny. Because for larceny, yeah. because they were real cards, but real they were cards. stolen. Well, he, ha he had possession of it, yes, so it was stolen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, what was his intention? And the investigations are still continuing, so the possibility exists that there may be other offenses, because if I would have stolen seven cards in this particular case, as, a, as an example, and making no direct reference to this particular matter, I can be charged with the offense of last knee. But if I were to give you one, Natalie, and you were to use that vaccination card um, falsely because you're unvaccinated, then you may be committing another offense. So you can be charged. So based but the person on who is receiving the card and using it can be charged that's as right, well. Because you're purporting to have something that actually you don't. Yeah, and the card and has that would be no what fraud. Yes, because the card in itself comes with a stamp, and the 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 forgery caters for for such things. So we have to be again mindful of what we do. And this is some advice to turn to the bureau: do not take the chance of having a card that you a, a vaccination card, sorry, where you are unvaccinated. If you are caught in mere possession of that card, you can be charged. Yeah. yeah, and you'll be charged for fraud. You'll be charged for and, fraud. And, and what's the, the, the sentence in or the punishment for that? I, off the top of my head, I think it's something like two years and I guess in the amount. Some money. A couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. 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 All right, Inspector, until next week, we have to leave it for now. But next week, of course, hopefully, if not you, somebody else from the TTPS will join us so that we can bring information to the people and give them relevant information so that we can stop assuming what we think the police can do and just absolutely know what the police can and will do. Thank you very much, Natalie. It's been a pleasure. Same here. All right, Inspector. I hope you, you went through the 15 minutes all right and you're good to go, right? Good to go. Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Inspector Steve McKenzie there speaking to us. And of course, don't get that vaccination card if you know you're unvaccinated because you can be charged for fraud. And of course, when we see these uh, situations with, you know, protests happening. Let's get all the information so that we can understand why the police approach each instance differently. We take a break and we'll be right back. Give me sugar when the morning come. Baby, push it back on me.